So next up, we have uh, Dr. Morteza Faragian, and uh, I'm going to point to the back and make sure we have the connection to him. He's uh, going to be virtual. Uh, Dr. Morteza, uh, uh, most folks might have tuned in to the uh, uh, first uh, keynote uh, session where we had the plenaries, uh, and we also had the fireside chat with uh, Dr. Hamshire and Dr. Uh, Malteza for Rajian. So he is kindly uh, accommodating us with a uh, presentation today. Uh, the, he's the executive director of the Build America Bureau, where he has served uh, as a senior executive leader since April of 2019. Uh, he's responsible for credit programs and loan guarantees with approximately 30 billion in the existing portfolio and nearly 100 billion in available lending capacity. So need I say more? Uh, are we able to connect? Can you hear me again? Oh, yes. I Perfect. Can. Uh, well, good Good morning, everyone. And um, I should apologize that uh, I'm not there in person. I was in Dallas up until yesterday, but I had to come back. So I probably seen many of you earlier this week uh, as part of the earlier events that they had um, over there. But uh, I'm glad that I'm able to join uh, today virtually. Uh, just wanted to take the opportunity and uh, follow the conversation that Dr. Hamshire and Administrator uh, Chalen just set the foundation for it, which is the biggest challenge right now is deployment. Uh, we are at the stage that we need to scale up. We are at the stage that we need to deploy. And I want to talk a little bit about some of the tools that we can provide from Build America Bureau at U.S. Department of Transportation that can possibly help those of you who are thinking about how to deploy your ideas and take it to the next stage. What is really important to understand is um, the tools that you have in your toolbox. So I will talk about a couple of them today, but uh, some of you may not be familiar with Build America Bureau. So let me just start at very high level and talk about uh, what Bureau does. Bureau is one-stop shop at Department of Transportation that was uh, set up within Office of Secretary of Transportation so that it's able to work with uh, all the modes that U.S. Department of Transportation has from uh, federal highway and roadways and tunnels and, and highways to ports, airports, rail, transit, and recently transit-oriented development and real estate development that we can finance around transit stations. Our programs are not new. TIFI and RIF have been around for over 25 years. As a matter of fact, before joining uh, Build America Bureau, I was probably number one borrower of uh, TIFIA program when I was uh, with Virginia Department of Transportation and uh, over my time, almost eight years in Virginia, we've built about $14 billion worth of uh, projects, most of them managed in projects, and most of them are financed through uh, TIFIA loan program. And why is it so uh, attractive and so important to, to know about it? Um, it's because um, it provides low interest rate loans, it's very flexible, uh, it's something that doesn't exist in market. And if you think about what is happening right now, which is uh, we had a couple of programs and some of them, you heard about them earlier today, a couple of grant programs that give you seed money. It's really the down payment on some of these projects to prove the concept, to make sure that people understand it works. But then when you want to scale it up, you need a lot more money than uh, what these grant programs can provide. The grant programs are limited. And we have seen how competitive they are. We have seen how much need is out there. And, and the grant programs cannot meet all of that need for full deployment. So what else do we have in the toolbox is basically the, the, the loan programs that would allow you to borrow, get your project built, have a period of time after that, because uh, with, with these loan programs, we can even structure them in a way that for the first five years after project completion, there's no payment. So during construction, no payment. First five years after project completion, no payment. It takes about five years, four years to build the project. The first payment would be due about 10 years down the road. So that flexibility is especially important for concepts like the concepts that we are talking about it today, technology concepts, that you need some room, some uh, flexibility to scale it up, 
get through the initial ramp up phase. And when project starts generating revenue in the future, we'll be able to pay back these loans. And of course, the loans are, are low interest rate. They're all subsidized. We get money from Congress to, to subsidize them. Today, somebody wanted to get a 30 or 40 year fixed rates from us. It would have been around 3.7%. Um, we also have private activity bonds that uh, if private companies want to issue their own bonds. Those bonds can be uh, made tax exempt. So um, the interest rate on those bonds would be slightly lower than, than what otherwise would have been issued in the market as taxable bonds. So all of these tools, and I wanna go back to the previous slide, and I'm glad that they have some of these slides as I'm talking about, all of these tools are in the toolbox, but we understand that it's difficult, it's hard to think about some of this innovative financing and, and uh, uh, funding options, put them together. Some of you, uh, may have great engineers within your team, but maybe not so much on uh, financing side, especially on the public sector side. Uh, the way that the state DOTs have been uh, functioning, they have been staffed up, they have been organized traditionally is not having finance people within their teams because in the past, we were just funding projects, 100%. We, we needed accountants, we needed engineers. Um, we were budgeting based on the revenues that we had. We would select how much projects we could get built. And, and we wanted to make sure that the right side and the left side of a balance sheet uh, would always add up. But that's not how we do things in our real life, right? We, we all buy houses, we go and get mortgage, we need a down payment, but we borrow and pay for it over time. Sometimes a little bit complicated. Sometimes we need some help. You need a real estate agent or, or you need somebody to walk you through the loan process and explain how it works. We have set up exactly a similar process within Bureau that you would have access to a couple of uh, technical assistance programs. So if you're not familiar with funding and financing and some of these innovative delivery options like public-private partnerships that was mentioned earlier, we can give you grant money. And most of these grant applications are very simple. There are no requirements, I would say minimum requirements. Some of them, they don't even have a match requirement. And they're meant to build capacity. They're meant to give you that initial funding that is going to help you to build capacity within your team, whether it's to hire internal staff or hire consultants so that you are able to think outside the box and you're able to think about some of those innovative options to have enough funding and financing in place to scale up and have enough flexibility in place that you can operate your project get through the ramp up phase and be able to pay back these loans. And we have listed some of them here. The one that I want to um, highlight for you is the innovative finance one. Um, and um, the regional infrastructure accelerator one. The regional infrastructure accelerator one, some of you heard from me earlier this week that we and uh, we published a NOFO. Notice a funding opportunity, $25 million is available. The application process is open. This is the third. Last two years, but this round we have $24 million. So that tells you that Congress now understands how important this program is. They have seen the success story and they are increasing the funding under that program. And just to tease you up a little bit more, the first two rounds, each round we got five complete applications and we selected every single complete application that we received. Maybe that's because the program was new, not many people knew about it, but now we are trying to make sure that more and more entities know about this opportunity and submit applications. So this round we expect poor competition, but still uh, we expect to award between five to 10 um, um, grant uh, awards. And each one of them is probably ranged around two to $5 million. As I mentioned earlier, this is all purely planning level grant meant to build capacity within your uh, organization. You have probably heard about thriving communities that was announced earlier uh, this month. I encourage you to also look at that because many communities have been selected to receive services from our consultants um, who would uh, provide uh, capacity to them to be able to, to look at some of these opportunities and hopefully um, be more competitive when they submit grant applications. And then innovative finance that I wanted to also highlight for you. We will have $40 million in terms of a new NOFO that is going to go out. This is going to be a new program um, that uh, under uh, the new infrastructure law, 
we have set up. We expect over the next couple of weeks, the new NOFO to go out. And it's very similar concept. It's meant to provide uh, grant money so that uh, project um, sponsors on the public side can look at existing infrastructure that they have, could be existing roadways, and figure out how they can make those um, uh, 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 assets a little bit more productive. Uh, look at what is underutilized that they can actually put it back in market either through public-private partnerships or, or other concepts and be able to unlock value from it. Um, I always use the example of a surface parking lot right next to a transit station that can be developed for uh, dense uh, mixed-use development. But there are other concepts as well. So I would challenge you to think about on the roadway side, how we can think about that program and, and how roadways can benefit from that program in terms of identifying underutilized assets and trying to get them to the right utilization, to the right capacity, unlocking value from them. With that, I want to just go to the uh, last slide. Um, we have a lot of different programs. Um, our doors are open, unlike some of the other uh, offices and uh, 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 departments within USDOT. We are not really in the competitive mode. Most of the time, we work with you. Most of the time, we sit at the table with you, not across the table from you. We try to uh, have workshops, brainstorming sessions. If you have an idea, give us a call. Don't be shy. Don't be afraid. Uh, we can set up meetings, uh, consultation sessions. We can walk you through the process, figure out whether your idea is eligible for something that uh, uh, we can finance for you or not. And then to the extent that uh, it is not, we try to tell you why it's not and try to find a way to get to yes. Uh, we have financed a lot of ITS projects in the past. As uh, Egan mentioned earlier, we have about $30 billion worth of outstanding loans right now. And I can just mention one project that I worked on it personally when I was in Virginia. I procured it, I negotiated that project, and that's I-66 express lanes outside Beltway. And I do remember when we were procuring that project, we put a lot of requirements in terms of uh, ITS improvements in that project. Well, that was a new project. They were building those express lanes for us, they didn't exist. Um, and we wanted to make sure that uh, everything that we could put in place for future utilization would go in place during construction because it's marginal cost at that stage, right? After that, if you want to go back and add to that project, it's going to be much more expensive. <clears throat> in that project, I remember that it has a lot of ITS components. It's probably one of the heavily uh, uh, utilized ITS uh, projects in, in, in the U.S. And I'm really glad that it went through uh, a process. Uh, those ITS components were eligible for financing as part of a bigger project. And they built it. It's operational now. The groundbreaking was last year. But I would like to see also some standalone ITS projects. We haven't really seen a standalone ITS project in the past. Maybe part of it is because there are not many of those in the country that would scale up to the level of cost that would be economically feasible. Because for these loans, the bigger it is, the more you can bundle, the more economical it will become. For a project that's just 20, 30, 40 million dollars, um, it may not be economical to go through the process because the savings may not be worth the time that you spent to go through, uh, through the process with us, unless it's in rural area. And I want to mention that for rural areas, a project is less than $100 million. We cut the interest rate to half. So that 3.7% I mentioned earlier, all of a sudden becomes 1.4%. Uh, did I do the math correctly? No, I didn't. 1.7%. Um, so that becomes very attractive. There are some states that are taking advantage of our programs for safety improvements in rural areas of their states. I encourage you again to think about what rural projects you can bring to us and take advantage of that rural initiative that I mentioned earlier. But really, if you can scale up, if you can uh, bundle your projects, if you can think a little bit bigger, if you can take advantage of the grants as the down payment, as the seed money, and then think about how you can come to us with a scaled up version of your project that can be financed, I think that will be the start of a very good conversation with my team. And we look forward to having those conversations with you. So with that, Egan, I'm going to 
uh, stop here. If there are questions and you're taking questions, I'll be, uh, I'll be happy to answer in the future. Uh, otherwise, I'm just going to listen to the rest of the presentations. Thank you very much.